Dr. Moran also studies the effects of environmental factors such as drought and soil nutrition on biocontrol agent reproduction, and he's published 90 papers in peer-reviewed journals and other formats. He holds a BS in biology and environmental studies from Tufts University and a PhD in entomology from Penn State University. So thanks for being here with us today, Dr. Moran, and I'll turn it over to you. So I appreciate the invitation um, to uh, speak today about biological weed control. I appreciate the work that uh, you guys do to control invasive species uh, using IPM techniques, trying to reduce, uh, minimize the use of chemicals and using uh, integrated techniques. So there's my uh, talk title. There's a, a couple of uh, a few co-authors on this talk um, who have contributed information, including Dr. Lincoln Smith, who is also a research entomologist. He's recently retired from the USDA unit uh, that I work for, but he's still very much active coming in, working on these projects. Dr. Paul Pratt is the research leader of the Invasive Species and Pollinator, Pollinator Health Research Unit. Um, and involved also, especially for the aquatic weeds that we work on. And Christopher Borkin, Dr. Christopher Borkin is a uh, scientist with the California Department of Food and Agriculture, which recently revived their biological control program for weeds just within the past couple of years. So that's been a great development, uh, great collaborations that we're able to have once again with, with CDFA. So I'll talk a little bit about invasive weeds in California. I'm, some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the problems that invasive weeds cause. Uh, I'll talk about sort of the uh, biocontrol, the definition, wh why why do it, uh, some advantages and risks, and the process. I was specifically asked today to talk about the process, um, the research process, the regulatory process. Well, I'll spend some time on that. I'll talk about the overview of uh, biocontrol, weed biocontrol in California. Uh, and then I'll focus, um, I won't have time to talk about every biocontrol system in California, but I'll talk mainly about projects that we, we're working on at the USDA ARS, either projects we recently completed or we're working on now. And, um, and then at the end, I'll talk about sort of uh, integrating weed biocontrol into weed IPM. And I'm focusing, I should mention, on non-crop areas. Um, Weed biocontrol is used mostly in non-crop environments such as forests, pastures, rangelands, riparian zones, wetlands, and aquatic habitats. So, of course, uh, in the U.S., uh, there are quite a few non-native plants, but not, not all of them are invasive. Uh, there's sort of a, a rule of tens that's developed where you have, um, if you have a certain number of uh, invasive plants, maybe one in I should say a certain number of non-native plants, maybe one in ten of them have the potential to become naturalized, and of those, of those, only one in ten um, become actually invasive and, and spread on their own. So it's about one in a hundred um, non-native plants uh, have the potential to become significant invaders. Um, in California, we have about uh, 1,500 non-native plant species out of 8,000. California is highly biodiverse, as we all know, for plants and and other other uh, types of species. State of California has a noxious weed list with 184 species. In order to uh, work with any of these plants, you have to have a permit from CDFA. So I have to have a permit to propagate Arundo and Cape Ivy and uh, plant other plants that are on the list. Um, California Invasive Plant Council or Cal Ipsy that uh, was just mentioned and they have their conference each year. Uh, they're a great resource for information on invasive weeds and they maintain an inventory uh, of invasive plants, which is larger than the CDFA list. Uh, they include plants that are not yet widely invasive, but have the potential to become invasive. So they use a scoring system. And um, the cost in California, this is probably an underestimate, the cost of $82 million per year. That's the, you have the cost of control and of course the environmental damage and economic damage that the weeds cause. So uh, just examples of the kinds of uh, damage that the weeds cause. Um, Preventing access uh, for use for like power line rights of way and rangelands, uh, invading forests and uh, riparian areas. Here's, uh, some of these habitats are very sensitive and are uh, provide habitat for a threatened and endangered species. Uh, I'm, I'm primarily um, my prim primary interest is the uh, consumption of, of natural resources. USDA That's ARS has as part of its you mission to um, protect natural resources, including water and soil. So uh, a lot of these weeds threaten those resources. Uh, many of the weeds provide fuel for wildfires when they dry out. Uh, and of course, they do outcompete native plants. Uh, they can 
become like ecosystem engineers where they alter the, uh, for example, they alter the flow of rivers if they occur in riparian habitats. Um, they reduce the quality of habitat for uh, for economic uses such as livestock production and uh, maybe overlooked in some cases, but they can provide habitat for crop pests. Some of these weeds provide uh, off season habitat for major crop pests. And there's ways to control these weeds. I won't read all the herbicides there, but uh, that's a list of most of the active ingredients that are registered right now in California for herbicide uh, products. Um, and uh, many of you have probably have experience applying herbicides to weeds. You have to, there's a lot of number of regulatory uh, processes you have to go through and uh, PPE and reporting and of course, uh, but there's other ways to control these weeds as well. There's hand pulling. You can send out a bunch of volunteers. Um, or paid staff uh, mechanical control with uh, tractors or uh, mowers. There's physical control and burning, tarping, and uh, things including goat grazing, which we've uh, seen in some of the projects that I've worked on. There's also efforts to plant native plants as competitors to exclude the uh, the weeds. So, what is biological biological control? Where it's a it's a natural phenomenon, where the action of parasites, predators, and pathogens to maintain an organism's population level at a level lower than would occur in their absence. So it's a natural predator-prey interactions that occur, occur all around us. But for invasive plants, we're talking about the introduction, and what I really mean is the intentional introduction of self-sustaining populations of pathogens, parasites, and or predators. And this, I'm talking today about herbivores to reduce densities of a pest organism. So today I'm talking about non-native invasive weeds. And the idea of bio, the basic concept of biological control is to reestablish natural relationships between uh, the invasive weed and the environment to um, reduce the population growth. So prior to, to the introduction of the biocontrol agent, you have a weed that varies seasonally, but it's present at high densities. It may be increasing its distribution. You introduce the biocontrol agent. Um, the weed population goes down. You know, the agent population goes up, the weed population goes down. And it's important to note that biocontrol is not an eradication tool. It's not an EDRR, time, an early detection rapid response kind of tool. Um, it's a long-term management tool, and it's especially beneficial in cases where other control methods are not sustainable, either economically and or environmentally. But the idea is to reduce the weed below a damage threshold, either an economic threshold or an environmental threshold, the weed is still present in the, in the system and the biocontrol agent remains present in the system. I get that question a lot. What happens when the weed is gone? Does the agent just start feeding on everything else? And that's not the case. Um, there's, there's an ecological balance between the biocontrol agents and the, uh, the weed that's been targeted with, with biocontrol. So um, again, this idea that biocontrol is used in cases where you have weeds that have spread widely and can't be sustainably controlled using other methods in non-crop areas. It hasn't really been used in crop situations, but in these non-crop areas, these important natural habitats. And you can have pretty impressive benefit to cost ratios for this for biocontrol um, around the world, up to 300 to one benefit to cost ratio. Um, the majority of agents released in modern times over the past 30, 40 years have established populations. And for the US, uh, about 45 weeds targeted since the 40s and uh, significant impacts. You see there are about 33% of cases. In California, the success, success, success rate is at 42%, but it is higher than in some other areas. These pictures on the bottom here are some before and after pictures from the Western US for some of the sort of uh, systems that have been worked on showing uh, significant impacts of uh, bio biological control agents to reduce the densities of non-native weeds. So advantages of biocontrol is that uh, you have uh, the biocontrol agents are host plant specific. They don't cause collateral damage to native plants as can happen sometimes with herbicides or mechanical grubbing, for example. The biocontrol agents are self-dispersing. Uh, once established, the biocontrol agents provide control at, at uh, little or no cost, and they, this, this technique can be integrated with uh, IPM, or I say I, IWM, integrated weed management, um, and I'll talk about that later. Uh, there are some disadvantages to biocontrol. There is an upfront cost in research investment, although that's also the case for herbicides. Um, it may take time for a biocontrol agent to establish, just to actually document the establishment, and take, take more time beyond that to see the impact. 
excuse me, it may not produce the desired level of control as opposed to an herbicide, which has this sort of dramatic effect. You see the dead plants within a few weeks. Uh, biocontrol is slow and it may not uh, produce the total level of control to, to avoid, avoid the use of other methods. And there are some risks associated with biocontrol, which I'll talk about. The biggest risk for biocontrol is the agent fails to establish. When I talk, when I say agent, I mean usually it's an insect or a mite, occasionally a fungal plant pathogen that is introduced uh, against a, 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 a targeted invasive weed. Uh, in some agents, not, not all agents establish populations and not all agents establish damaging populations. Uh, one of the most common reasons is climatic incompatibility. And um, you can do climate modeling, for example, to to um, look for biocontrol agents in areas that have a similar climate to the area of release um, and uh, do what's called climate matching. There is microclimate issues, site to site variability within the area that you release the agent. That's you can't really avoid that. You will have variable success based on that. Non target plant damage. I get asked about this a lot. Of course, it is a concern um, that uh, we address with host range testing. And there is a scientific process called the phylocentric centrifugal method of selection of plants to test. Um, you emphasize native plants in the same genus, subtribe, tribe, subfamily, and family. Um, you then expand out to the same order. Um, also unrelated habitat associate, associates, plants with similar morphology. You can also test a few unrelated crop plants. And I'll talk a little bit about the uh, how we do the testing. But you see um, an example here with Cape Ivy, where we start with the closest closest relative, um, this sort of uh, weird plant from South Africa called Curio talanoides, and then expand out uh, to other plants in the family Asteraceae. You can also do surveys of related plants in the native range, even if they don't occur in North America, you can sort of define the natural host range of the biocontrol agent. A non-target damage, uh, there's been a number of surveys, uh, research uh, reviews uh, on this in recent years, and can, one, one review considered quite a few releases of biocontrol agents, um, some, you know, a certain percentage, 13% of the agents since the 1940s, but in more recent years, um, that's been decreased. There's various kinds of non-target damage that can occur. Uh, you can have sort of nibbling on a non-target plant with no reproduction can have spillover damage where the, the target weed is overwhelmed and then a uh, related native plant um, gets some feeding, potentially some development, but not sustained. And then sustained damage, the agent is able to reproduce uh, independently on the non-target plant, um, just as it does on the weed. In the modern era, um, there were 9% uh, of agents and 5% of releases with non-target feeding. And uh, since 1991, uh, 20 of 220 agents caused non-target damage, but 18 of those were collateral or spillover, not sustained. So there was no uh, sustained risk to a non-target plant. When non-target damage does occur, uh, they're always in the same family as the target weed. So in California, we do have uh, high plant diversity, so we have to consider the native plants when we do the host range testing. Another risk um, is that the agent establishes, and it's safe, it's host specific, but it fails to reduce the targeted weed. So the, the plant, the weed may tolerate damage. Uh, you, you can uh, do pre-release efficacy studies to, uh, to account for that, see how much damage it causes prior to doing uh, a release, examine effects on weed growth, survival, and reproduction. I mentioned climate, uh, the climate can be limiting. You can do climate matching. Um, and then there's the, the issue of parasites or predators that are already present in the in, in the area uh, that's been invaded by the weed that might latch on to the biocontrol agent as a uh, food source. Um, and there has been some studies, have been some studies on that. There's not a lot of empirical evidence for that um, actually causing an ecological problem, but we have seen cases where weed biocontrol agents are uh, adopted as hosts by uh, native natural enemies uh, in, in, in a few cases. So there is a, a, pipe, a pipeline of or a, a process for weed biocontrol, and I'll go through I'll go through different stages of this. Um, and uh, the idea is that there's a foundation of many different disciplines of uh, biological sciences. So it's not just entomology, it's ecology, it's molecular biology, it's uh, botany, um, and uh, sometimes of uh, plant physiology, uh, phytochemistry. 
and quite a few. Um, it's an inter- this is an interdisciplinary area, and so we we collaborate with other scientists in many cases. So the first stage is to, you know, that we go through is to prioritize targets to uh, weed targets to work on, and we uh, we do weed impact assessments. Uh, we did one rec- a few years ago for the Western U.S. Um, we talked to a state agency and, and state weed councils and looked at their lists of, in, of uh, invasive plants. Uh, we assigned an impact score based on what was known in, in the, the literature. And uh, we, that we actually held a workshop with natural resource managers and weed can not biocontrol practitioners, but weed control practitioners to assess sort of the difficulty of controlling these weeds. And then we did a biocontrol, biological control feasibility assessment. Um, sort of verifying the identity of the, of, the, the, of the weed, looking at how many real closely related plants are present in the Western U.S. or in, in the U.S. in general, um, and then looking at where the native range of the weed is. Uh, that can influence the feasibility. If, it's an, if it, For example, if it's an area that's difficult to explore because of uh, political considerations or other, other issues. Um, and we do literature surveys on what, what's known about potential uh, herbivores, potential uh, um, plant feeding insects or mites, for example, that feed on the plant in the native range or even in the invaded range. Perhaps there's some uh, non-native or native insects that have, are using the plant, the weed as a host in the invaded range. So we get a sort of a uh, combined score and then we, we can use that to prioritize uh, targets for biocontrol development. Once we've done that, we can determine sort of the genetic origin of the weed invasion. Uh, there's This is standard now um, that we, we can sample in the invaded range and the native range. There's a number of molecular techniques available. This example on the left here is from a project that I'm involved with, with ice plant, where we sampled in South Africa, the Canary Islands. Uh, South Africa is in black and the Canary Islands in blue and U.S. samples in red. And uh, so the native range is South Africa. Um, and it's non-native in both the Canary Islands and in California. And we, we can see that there are certain populations in California um, in red that are close to some of the South African populations genetically. So we could prioritize those for um, to examine for potential biocontrol agents. Uh, we can also look at genetic variation in biocontrol agents. Once we have uh, agents identified, we can collect them from different locations. Uh, if they occur on other plants in the native range, we can we can uh, collect them from that. Um, and then, of course, I mentioned climate matching. Uh, California's Mediterranean climate is uncommon. Of course, it occurs in the Mediterranean, uh, western uh, the coast of Chile, extreme southwestern South Africa, parts of western Australia. Um, and most of the western U.S. is not Mediterranean. It's more of a continental climate or a desert climate. Um, so you can it's you can sort of narrow down the area to explore based on climate modeling um, as well as on the genetic genetic studies. And then foreign exploration, this is the uh, the, uh, the fun one of the really fun parts um, of, of biocontrol is being able to go to um, to uh, areas where the weed is native and explore from biocontrol agents. We do rely heavily on foreign institutions and scientists. Uh, we're, we're proud to collaborate with universities. Um, Australia, South Africa, um, the Mediterranean. We actually own a laboratory in France that specializes in biologic control of both insects and weeds, and they they focus on the Mediterranean basin. Um, there you see the most source, the common sources of California's weeds. Not surprisingly, the Mediterranean basin is important because the climate similarity. Um, and we do the exploration. We we have we have the molecular information in hand. We have the climatic information. We kind of narrow down the search area. We uh, collect lots of samples. We dissect them in the lab uh, to try to get an idea of the biology of potential insects. And then finally, we uh, get permits to ship candidate biocontrol agents to a quarantine lab. So we have a quarantine lab in Albany uh, where we can work on biocontrol agents um, that we've identified as being potential to uh, have significant impact on the on the weed. Just uh, the research facilities we have in Albany. Uh, we have, uh, as I mentioned, the quarantine lab. It also has quarantine greenhouses. Uh, we have supporting non-quarantine facilities. Um, we have an aquatic quarantine greenhouse. Um, also, uh, we have a satellite laboratory at close to UC Davis where they specialize in aquatic weeds. And that's not just biocontrol. That's all different kinds of control. But they have non-quarantine facilities where we can, um, for example, if we have an agent, we could do mass rearing there of the agent, uh, but they can also do integrated weed studies there. 
So going back to the research, um, once we have an agent in quarantine, I won't go through all of this because there's a lot here, but we do biological evaluations of the life cycle, and then we do the critical host range testing. It's important to note that there's several different kinds of host range testing. Uh, we, we start with no choice tests where the biocontrol agent has to feed and survive or die on the non-target plant. And then we have cages with the target plant running at the same time as sort of positive controls. So, and then, um, but we also do other kinds of tests. We do dual, dual choice tests comparing the non-target plant um, to the target weed in the same cage. We do larval transfer tests. Um, can, if the insect is mobile, can it get from uh, a non-target plant? If, if uh, the target weed is overwhelmed, can it crawl onto a non-target plant? And that's the same idea for spillover. Um, and we do efficacy evaluations. Um, in the, and we can do these in the greenhouse, and that's kind of the traditional way of doing it in the quarantine greenhouse. We can look at plant damage, plant size. Recently, um, we've been asked by regulatory agencies to do more realistic efficacy evaluations, and we can do these in the native range with the biocontrol agent. Um, we can use farm and garden plots. We can use insect, insecticide exclusion to protect the weed um, from the biocontrol agent and compare it to unprotected plants and look at various measures of impact. So now I'm going to go into the regulatory process uh, for weed biocontrol agents. So um, there's a rather uh, complex regulatory process involved in getting permission to release biocontrol agents. Uh, the first step is what we call the TAG petition. And this is um, a group of scientific peers and agency designees from the US, but also from Mexico and, can and uh, Canada. So the idea is that biocontrol agents released in the US could impact Mexico and Canada. So it's, so it's you know, considered all of North America for this uh, stage of the process. And so the scientists such as myself who is leading the project puts together what's called a tag petition. And this is a substantial document that has detailed information on the target weed, the proposed biocontrol agent, what the proposed action is, which is to release release the biocontrol agent. So where 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 are we going to release it? Um, and uh, the host range information, uh, you know, a detailed long table uh, showing all the host plants that were tested and what the uh, uh, the fact that the agent wasn't able to uh, feed and or develop on non-target plants, impact studies, efficacy studies, and then a conclusion that the proposed release is needed and will be beneficial. Um, so there's the tag members review this. Uh, petition, the TAG chair issues a, a summary recommendation to the USDA Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, or APHIS, to either release or not release the agent. This recommendation is non-binding. Um, if it's the recommendation is to release, the scientist applies to the USDA APHIS for a release permit. The next step is the biological assessment. So this is prepared by the USDA APHIS in compliance with the Endangered Species Act federal U.S. Endangered Species Act. This is considered a Section 7 informal consultation with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, it sort of summarizes information from the TAG petition, um, but it also adds information on any of the uh, federally, federally threatened or endangered species, any type of uh, organism for which there's a connection or a nexus to the proposed release. It also considers species that are state listed. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service sends this to their regional offices in the area of proposed release. There's also a national uh, office that reviews. And the uh, conclusion must be either no effect or may affect not likely to adversely affect. Um, so no take or killing of uh, listed species there. That's the regulatory term is take. And um, so uh, that's sort of the conclusion of this biological assessment. And the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service must concur with that conclusion. And then if that, if U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service grants concurrence, the regulatory process goes on to the environmental assessment. This is again prepared by the USDA APHIS um, with help from the lead scientists. This is to comply with the National Environmental Policy Act. It summarizes information from the TAG petition and the biological assessment, adds information on the environmental consequences to both humans and the environment uh, of doing the release of the biocontrol agent versus no action. And the conclusion there that the release effects of the release will not be adverse and may be beneficial. Um, Native American tribes are involved in the, re the review process of the environmental assessment. It's also sent to relevant state agencies, such as California Department of Food and Agriculture. There's also a 30-day public comment period. 
Um, if the responses are um, to the comments from uh, various stakeholders and the public are satisfactory to APHIS, um, they issue a finding of no significant impact, which means no significant negative impact uh, or FONSI, and then they publish a link to the final environmental assessment in the Federal Register. So the last stage in the regulatory process is to get an actual release permit from the USDA APHIS. Uh, the permit covers the entire continental US or CONUS, but it specifies the area of release. Uh, the relevant state agencies concur with the permit. CDFA is the relevant agency for California. So when they concur, um, this implies that the completion of a CEQA process, which some of you may fam be familiar with from uh, various projects. Uh, now to release on you know, a, a given landowner's land, you need to get permission from the landowner, whether it's federal, state, regional, or local public agencies, or a private landowner. Um, you still have to get permission to actually work on their land, uh, release the agent. Um, the, the release permit specifies which state, the states the biocontrol agent will, will be released in. In some cases, other states may want to um, obtain the biocontrol agent and do releases, but they have to get their own permit for interstate movement from the USDA APHIS. And the CDFA does re regulate intrastate movement within California of some, some weed biocontrol agents. Going back to the research process, now that we have a release permit, um, we have to rear and release the agent. And uh, so moving it from quarantine to non-quarantine is usually an adjustment uh, because we're trying to sort of scale up the rearing, uh, whether it's in greenhouses or in field cages. And we do research at this stage uh, to sort of fine tune the rearing process, uh, improve production, so make sure we're producing healthy, healthy uh, insects or mites to release. And then actually doing the release, we start with a small number of sites, uh, release in field cages, on bagged branches, on infested plants that are placed out in the field or just in the open field as adults that are just released without a cage. But typically we do use some kind of caging um, mechanism because we want to sort of um, define sort of the release area and uh, look at look at the ability of the agent to establish. And we do research on sort of release strategies, uh, one release versus multiple releases, for example. The USDA ARS does not do large scale releases. Um, we rely on stakeholder agencies to sort of expand uh, uh, biocontrol programs. Once we have an agent that we've demonstrated can establish and have impact, we often do have stakeholders um, who pick up pick up the process from there while we move on to another, another weed target and, and the research process. So uh, part of the research process is to look at agent establishment and dispersal. So uh, we survey for damage. Uh, we, we usually damage is visible, visible externally. Uh, we collect samples and take them to the lab to count uh, internal feeding insects. Uh, we define overwintering as in the ability of the agent to uh, survive at least one year after the most recent release. So independently of doing any additional releases, can the agent uh, still survive and uh, in increase its population? Uh, we, so this requires several years of data to conclude that the agent is established. And then we look at dispersal. Uh, is the agent present in other, other weed populations where it was not released? And we actually do see that. Uh, for example, the case of the Arundo wasp, um, 6.4 kilometers of dispersal, or the Cape Ivy shoot tip galling fly, a few miles of dispersal along the coast to a, to a site where we didn't release it. So we can, we can track that. Looking at efficacy or impact, um, this goes beyond measuring uh, damage. This is looking at the uh, the ability of the uh, weed bar control agent to reduce the biomass of the weed or potentially to kill individual uh, stems of the weed. So we count the live and dead stems. We look at biomass. We look at uh, reproduction. And uh, we can look at the weed distribution. There's many remote sensing technologies now that are, have been used in a, few, in a few cases for weed biocontrol agents where you can actually detect the damage from, from the air or from space. Um, you can do insecticide protection studies, protect plots of the weed and look at the impact on protected versus unprotected plants. Uh, those studies do have some difficulties with uh, getting the insecticide to work in some cases. Um, and then we look at the impact as well on the plant community. We can do uh, standard botanical um, ecological techniques to look at the uh, diversity of plants, including the weed. But over time, we can see uh, the weed decrease and native plants or uh, increase. Uh, there's been a few cases where uh, weed biocontrol impacts on communities of other, organi or other organisms has been examined, uh, examined for example, um, insects, other kinds of insects, not, not the biocontrol agent, but other kinds of insects that are present in the community. 
And then the uh, sort of last stage or one of the last stages um, is to look at the integration of biocontrol into uh, integrated weed management or IWM or IPM of the targeted weed. Um, we've done studies looking at the effects of herbicides on uh, biocontrol agents or the direct toxicity. We can do that in the lab. We can also use mes mesocosms, uh, spray spray plants that have the biocontrol agent and then sample the plants maybe a day or two later, see if they're, if they're still alive after the herbicide is sprayed. Uh, we can also look at uh, wheat populations that regrow. We said almost inevitably you do get regrowth after herbicide treatment or these other non uh, other te control techniques. And so we can compare the agent density. We can look at the ability of the agent to limit regrowth. Um, and uh, you can do this either as part of a uh, operational program where a large site is being treated, or you can do sort of plot type studies where uh, small plots are sprayed and um, with herbicide, and then you look at the ability of the biocontrol agent to limit, limit the regrowth. So an historical overview of biocontrol projects, um, California. So a um, total of 40 weeds targeted in California and 80 biocontrol agents released as of 2023. I mentioned that 42% of the projects have led to at least moderate uh, to up to major impact on the weed. A number of projects where it's too early to evaluate success. Uh, the first use of biocontrol in North America started right here in California. This was Klamath weed or St. John's wort. Uh, there were two beetles that were introduced from, uh, from Europe and also a moth. And uh, the before and after was quite dramatic uh, reduction in the, in, of the, uh, the weed species. Klamath weed is still around. Um, there'd be still, uh, I hear still, still hear from stakeholders that uh, it still pops up in different places. Uh, the biocontrol agent uh, usually catches up to it. Um, this uh, this beetle, one of these beetles, had such a huge beneficial impact that there was a monument to the beetle that was used to stand in Fortuna, California. Uh, the ranchers were so appreciative of having this biocontrol project uh, uh, save their uh, their ability to uh, to um, make a livelihood in those areas. So, yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, salt cedar, which is a or tamarisk, which is a project that we've been involved with for a number of years. Um, salt cedar, as some of you have, if you've worked out with uh, National Park Service or other agencies, a big problem in the Western U.S. And uh, USDA ARS found these um, beetles in the genus uh, Diarabda that feed on on salt cedar, and uh, all the way these beetles' native range extends it's from China all the way to North Africa. And uh, so it turns out there were four different species that were released um, in the U.S. Over, starting in about 2000. And uh, the beetles uh, were released and then they spread on their own into different areas. And they, they were released at several sites in California, including in Cache Creek in uh, not too far, uh, Solano County, County, also in um, Inyo County around Bishop, California. And those initial initial releases were not very successful. And it turns out they needed to release a different species of beetle um, to get to, to success. So this was done um, about 2005. Uh, some sci a scientist who's now retired released uh, a, a species of the beetle in Cache Creek and quickly got uh, large scale defoliation along the creek of the salt cedar. They could actually detect this from uh, space using satellites. and um, and it was, it was pretty impressive uh, damage there. And then, uh, but more recently, uh, we've done a survey in different parts of California, and these beetles are still present in, at these sites, but they're not spreading. They're not having additional impact. There, there are still some salt cedar plants. The density is reduced, so we don't have total control. Another case where we haven't eradicated the weed, it's still there, but it is present um, at uh, reduced density. Dalmatian toad flax is a, uh, a major weed in the western U.S. Um, no biocontrol agents were uh, had previously been uh, intentionally released into California, but this weevil here, the stem weevil, spread into California on its own is what we call an adventive biocontrol agent, and CDFA found it in northeastern California. They then intentionally released it in southern California at a uh, site that was invaded, invaded with Dalmatian toad flax, and um, they found this sort of exponential increase in the weevil populations. This goes back to that uh, graph that I showed earlier, uh, that hypothetical graph where the biocontrol agent increases its population so that almost every plant is infested. And then um, you see uh, potential for reduction of the, uh, the weed. But in this case, there was a fire that wiped out 
the, the uh, biocontrol agent, but the weed came right back. Uh, so USDA re-released the weevil in 2014. And again, we saw this uh, pattern of uh, large scale increase in the biocontrol agent population. And basically every stem was infested. The weevil spread from the, the release sites to the non-release sites, what were supposed to be the, the back backup sites and essentially infested the entire population. And over time, um, there was a major uh, increase in the weevil population and a reduction in Dalmatian toad flax, 99% reduction in the abundance of Dalmatian toad flax by 2018, 2019, and the plants that were still there were smaller. So it's an example of a successful project um, at this site in Southern California. Scotch broom is another uh, project that we sort of finished working up on. Uh, this is a major problem in Northern California. But um, there are several agents that were introduced uh, several decades ago. But more recently, there's this mite, the Scotch broom mite, that again is an adventive agent spreading into California on its own. So scientists, including Paul Pratt um, from our unit, did some studies to see uh, is this is this mite safe? Is it is it does it have the potential to, to attack native plants in California? And the answer from those studies was no. It does appear to be safe. And does it have impact? And it turns out. Um, it can have significant impact on Scotch broom. So even though this is an unintentional release of a biocontrol agent uh, in California, it is uh, potentially suitable for redistribution within California as a in, you know, impactful biocontrol agent. We'll talk about some recent releases of biocontrol agents against weeds in California and um, yellow star thistle, which I'm sure many of you have dealt with. Um, if you're out. Uh, even in the urban areas around San Francisco, or if you've worked out in the Central Valley or even on, on the East Bay, big problem, uh, major weed, uh, one of the worst weeds in the Western US and one of the worst in California, uh, just major damage, uh, wasting water, sort of occupying rangelands. And there's several agents that were released decades ago that feed on the seed heads. Um, there's a hairy weevil, there's a couple of flies, um, and they can reduce seed production by 80 to 90%, but the plant produces so many seeds that there's still a lot of yellow star thistle. And one problem is that uh, these weeds have habitat preference, yeah, I'm sorry, these agents have habitat preferences. They only occur in certain areas. So uh, USDA scientists led by Dr. Lincoln Smith, who I mentioned is a co-author on this talk, uh, discovered this weevil in Northern Greece in the native range of yellow star thistle that feeds on the taproot and the rosette. Uh, so it doesn't rely on seed production or it, it, it can feed on the immature plants. So that's a major breakthrough. It's the first new agent released against yellow star thistle and the first that feeds on the immature plants, which come up in the late winter and early spring. So um, the, we got a permit for this weevil in 2019 and the first releases were done in 2020. Of course, we did our due diligence. We did the host range testing before doing the release. We verified that it was safe for release. And uh, we had some interesting uh, challenges working with this insect. Uh, it only has one generation per year naturally, but uh, innovative work by Lincoln Smith and a postdoctoral researcher found that they could get the weevil to produce multiple generations in the lab by sort of uh, using hormones and cold treatment to sort of trick the weevil into reproducing at different times of year. And um, they also figured out they sort of fine tune the rearing process. And now we've transferred this technology to four rearing laboratories, including CDFA in Sacramento and uh, three out of state laboratories because yellow star thistle is a problem in other areas. So now uh, weevils are being produced and uh, we've released them at three sites so far in California and Northern California. And uh, we're still looking at establishment. We're still in sort of that initial phase trying to see if it's established and uh, doing doing the surveys. I work on Arundo Donax, which uh, uh, major invasive weed uh, throughout California and the southwestern U.S. Uh, uh, consumes and wastes waters, uh, fuels wildfire fires, alters uh, the flow patterns of rivers, just causes lots of different problems. And uh, a scientist, I worked with a scientist when I used to work in Texas at uh, USDA lab in Texas. We found this uh, shoot tip galling wasp in the uh, in France and Spain in, in the native range of Arundo that uh, makes galls on the shoot tips. And we did our we, we did the host range testing and the pre-release impact testing. And we got a permit to release initially in the Rio Grande Basin of US and Mexico in Texas and Mexico. And uh, we released the uh, the wasp there and we found significant impacts. Uh, 
a reduction of biomass and an increase in the diversity of other plants. So this looked very promising. Uh, CDFA released this initially in California in 2010. Um, I started doing releases in 2013 of the wasp. Uh, but starting in 2017, we started a, a more wide scale release program. Uh, we had uh, sites in the uh, northern Sacramento River Valley, the southern San Joaquin River Valley, and in the Delta, where the two rivers come together. And uh, we had wasps from, from the re release areas in Texas that we released in California uh, at these sites. Before doing the releases, we pre-treated the plots. This is, this is sort of an example of integrated control. We uh, cut the plots to the ground or we mowed them to one meter height, about chest height, or about waist height, I should say, and then we release the wasps into the regrowth. So the idea is that the wasps uh, feed better on the regrowth than they do on the original plants. And indeed, the exit holes made by adult wasp exiting the shoots was much higher in plots that had been prepped in this way versus plots that were not cut. So sort of improved local establishment in the plots. And then uh, we did uh, wa you know, Arundel wasp establishment surveys. We um, counted the number of exit holes made by the wasps uh, and also immature galls without holes. We did that for several years at, uh, at these 11 sites in Northern California. We also dissected shoots. Uh, just, just this year, we also employed yellow sticky traps to trap the adult wasps. And so we have multi-year evidence of establishment at 10 of the 11 sites. In the northern Sacramento River Valley, we have evidence of dispersal up to 6.4 kilometers uh, based on this two minute surveys. And in the southern San Joaquin Valley, it's more localized. These Arundel populations are kind of isolated, but we do have good evidence of establishment initially at the site shown in, in the uh, orange uh, circle there at the bottom, and then uh, more recently at the other two sites. In the Delta, we have evidence of establishment of the wasp at all five of the sites that we, where we released it, both in the Western Delta and the, the Southern Delta. So just combining all the different survey techniques, the uh, two minute uh, exit hole surveys, you can see a picture of the exit hole there on the lower left, um, dissecting material and then using the sticky traps, almost all of the sites we have evidence of establishment of the wasp. So we can't say anything about impact yet, but in terms of establishment, this is um, a successful project. We've also done other manipulations uh, of the plots to try to improve establishment. For example, double, double cutting plots, cutting to ground and then mowing the regrowth. We get even better establishment when we do that. And uh, so we just, we just get increased um, exit holes when we do double cutting versus single cutting. We've also integrated this with herbicide control in the Delta. We've had three sites at which herbicides were applied, but the biocontrol plots were left untreated. And then we inevitably we did start seeing regrowth uh, after the herbicide application. So we examined the uh, densities of the wasp in the regrowth, and we found that uh, at uh, all three of these sites there was more attack of the wasp on the regrowth than the original biocontrol plots. The wasp were actually going into the regrowth, uh, so the potential we haven't demonstrated the wasp is reducing the ability of the plant to regrow, but at least we have this potential for the wasp to interfere with the ability of the plant to recover after herbicide application. I've also released an armored scale, which uh, feeds on Arundo, has a much longer life cycle, about a six month life cycle, and um, causes damage and distortion to, the, to the, uh, the side shoots. We've released it at all of the sites in Northern California, and we have evidence of establishment at nine of the 11 sites. Uh, this this wasp this this agent can't disperse like the wasp it can't fly it's immobile for most of its life cycle so we're looking at the impact at a more local level but those uh, those studies are in progress but in terms of establishment again we have evidence of success and there's also a third agent for Arundo that we're working on the Arundo leaf miner um, which feeds on the leaf sheets and uh, we have this insect in quarantine and we're doing studies on how to rear it. And uh, potentially in the future, we could release this, uh, especially in areas where the wasp doesn't do very well, like sort of cooler sites in the far north um, where we've had some issues. Uh, the uh, the leaf miner is, is better adapted potentially to some of those really cooler, cooler areas. For Cape Ivy, uh, I don't, I'm sure you've seen Cape Ivy. If you're working out of San Francisco there in Golden Gate Park, um, other areas, uh, significant invader along the coast of California. This project was started um, a number of years ago before I came to the lab here in California. Uh, there's a shoot tip galling fly that's been released. And um, 
The plant is native to South Africa. Uh, it has not, produces pretty flowers at this time of year, but that's about the only good thing about it. It's just sort of a nasty invader in, in many cases and um, um, grows in many different habitats. Um, there's a couple of pictures here showing how, how it can sort of overwhelm other plants, sort of become this sort of vine that takes over the habitat. And so the shoe tip galling fly was discovered by a previous USDA scientist um, in South Africa. Uh, makes galls on the shoot tips and pre-release studies suggested that it could have a lot of impact on the of the ability of the plant to grow and produce new shoots. And uh, the idea here is that um, once we have a permit to release, we, re we release um, the adults into the field and then the uh, we get galls. And then a new generation of adults comes out and makes new field galls and spreads beyond the point of release. So the re these releases were done. Uh, the permit was granted in 2016, and we used both uh, caged adults and also put out galled plants at field sites. And we have evidence of establishment at 12 sites of, along the coast and evidence of dispersal um, at a couple of these sites. So uh, there's just a uh, overview of the sites in which we've done caged plant releases and uh, also where we put out uh, galled plants, essentially put, putting, putting out galled plants um, in a circle as, as sort of a release plot, leaving the plants out for several months. Then we take the plants back to the lab and verify that the, uh, the fly has emerged. And uh, this, this galled plant release method has actually been a little bit more efficient than putting out adults. Uh, the majority of the sites in which we put out the galled plants, we see evidence of establishment based on uh, surveys. We just, we just finished our surveys this, for this year and uh, we have good evidence of establishment at these sites. So, and we're seeing increases in density. This is important. Um, over time, the insect varies seasonally in density. The highest density is in the late summer and the fall, but we get uh, increases from one year to the next in the density. And uh, so that's indicative of a well-established biocontrol agent with potential for impact. And now, now we're starting to measure impact. We're looking at the impact on Cape Ivy. We're also doing plant community surveys to measure the impact uh, benefits for uh, native plant communities at these coastal sites. And this is uh, this increase is true for the, the galled plant method as well. We see this increase in the population. An example of research to improve rearing is we've done some studies. Um, we, we rear the insect, um, the Cape Ivy fly, at constant temperature and growth chambers. And we evaluate uh, how fast does it get through its life cycle? What's the total reproduction? These different temperatures and we can define the optimal rearing temperature. But uh, equally important or more important, we can sort of use this information to predict where the insect has the best chance of establishing. And uh, so we, we can determine sort of what the temperature extreme tolerances uh, are of the insect. And uh, that's useful information. And um, or actually for any biocontrol agent, but you have to do you have to do this separately for each agent. Each age, each biocontrol agent has its own uh, ability to tolerate different climatic conditions. And we also have a second agent for Cape Ivy, a, a moth. Uh, we have a uh, in, that we've been rearing in quarantine. We hope to have a permit to release this in the future. We're right now we're submitting the application uh, for permission, the tag petition to release this agent in the future. Talk briefly about water hyacinth, which is a big problem out in the Delta. Um, we released almost 500,000 of this uh, tiny um, leaf uh, plant hopper that feeds, sort of sucks the juices out of the cells inside the leaf. And we did, haven't, didn't get very good establishment of this, maybe a couple of sites in the Southern Delta, but we're continuing to monitor this. Uh, there's also been other agents that have been released against water hyacinth, including a couple of weevils and a moth that were released by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Corps of Engineers in the 80s, and uh, so we're following up on that as well. Uh, the, the gorse, some of you may have experience working with gorse in Northern California. There's a uh, tiny little thrips that was uh, originally permitted by Oregon State University, and then the USDA ARS was asked to uh, do releases in California. Not considered very successful so far. Um, only one thrips recovered at each of two of the six release sites. Uh, we'll, we'll continue to monitor that, and we do have a colony of the thrips in our greenhouse in Albany. So, this is a project uh, not of USDA, but of the CDFA. Uh, Japanese knotweed is a big problem uh, in far northern California, and there's this biocontrol agent uh, that's been permitted again uh, out of Washington and Oregon that CDFA is releasing in California. 
So the very new project, see if it's uh, not sure if it's established yet. And sort of an older target, Russian knapweed. Uh, there's two agents that have actually been shown to be pretty successful in the Western US that CDFA has been releasing. And since they since their pro program was revived, they've started doing releases again, including in Southern California. So not just in Siskiyou County, but down in Southern California, hoping to establish um, this uh, shoot tip galling wasp. And so another shoot tip galling wasp, not the same as the Arundo wasp, uh, but a different species and this midge fly. Um, and these both have the potential for, for impact. And this is a, again, a CDFA project. So there's some insects uh, or candidate weeds for which we're studying insects and um, talk just about aquatic plants. So Dr. Paul Pratt, who uh, is the research leader, does a lot of work on aquatic plants, including water hyacinth, water primrose and alligator weed, where um, there's a lot of genetic work being done. There's uh, efforts to introduce biocontrol agents, but first to do the host range testing. So we have weed that we're doing the host range testing. Water primrose is an example of a very difficult target because there are actually native members of the same genus uh, in the US and in California. So finding something that's host specific enough just to that invasive species is, is, is quite difficult. Um, but we are doing the host range test and we've gone, we've already rejected several agents that are not host specific enough. So we, we do go through a rigorous process. French broom is a big problem in Northern California in forests and, and riparian habitats. There's a couple of uh, insects that were introduced decades ago that feed on the seeds. Uh, we've been working on a couple of agents, including the another shoot tip galler. In this case, it's a weevil that galls the shoot tips and uh, can cause a significant amount of damage on seedlings. Um, and we have this in quarantine. We're doing host range testing. There's also a psyllid that feeds on the plant juices. Um, there's some issues where it can feed on some native lupins. For example, we have these beautiful native lupins that are important habitat components. And uh, these, are the, these are the kinds of species that we need to test for the, for the French broom agents. And of course, we've, we've been doing that. Russian thistle. Big problem along highways, uh, Northern California, and uh, there's, there's a couple of moths that were introduced in the 70s, but the big story here is we have this uh, shoot tip feeding mite that, uh, that Lincoln Smith worked on for many years, and now we're pretty close to having a permit to release. Um, this would be the first new agent for Russian thistle in 30 or 40 years, and uh, potentially tackling one of the biggest problems. Um, there's also a shoot tip galling moth um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, a shoot boring moth that we're working on in quarantine doing the host range testing. And a new focus for us are invasive annual grasses. We've hired two scientists to work on these grasses. Um, you might not think grasses are good targets for weed biocontrol, but uh, you actually uh, can potentially find insects or mites that will feed only on the invasive grass and not on native grasses. So cheatgrass and Medusa head are big problems, and uh, we're working on potential biocontrol agents for them, including these are, these are just potential agents. We don't actually have anything in our quarantine lab right now, but we've identified potential candidate agents overseas. And in the future, in the near future, we may have these in our quarantine lab doing, doing studies. I'm working also on a crystalline ice plant, which is a problem in the Channel Islands, uh, sort of taken over. <clears throat> the channel um, areas in the Channel Islands sort of displacing native species and salinizing the soil, sort of ruining, ruining the habitat. And uh, this is an example of an earlier stage in the biocontrol project where we were doing, we've done the genetic sampling. We sampled in California, also in the Mediterranean basin where this plant is also invasive and in the native range in South Africa. And we have a collaborator there. And I already showed this uh, where we sort of isolated where in South Africa to look for biocontrol agents. And um, it turns out there are very few uh, only this is a good target for biocontrol because there's only two native members of this entire family that are present as in California, these two species here. So compared to example for thistles where you have lots of native thistles, in this case, uh, very few native relatives. They're not they're not even close, that closely related. They're in a different subfamily. So. But there are a number of uh, non-native ornamental uh, members of the ice plant family. Um, some of them are naturalized in their own right, um, but these are other species that will test uh, for ice plant agents. And we, we've been doing the foreign exploration and we have potential candidate agents, including the stem warring uh, weevil that uh, we're, we're uh, 
starting to get into we're hoping to get into quarantine soon to do do host range testing and some host range testing has been done in South Africa. And we have some uh, potential candidates for a different ice plant, uh, Mesembryanthum notiflorum. Uh, this is at an earlier stage. We're trying to sort of identify potential candidate agents. This is the foreign exploration stage. So I'm going to go into sort of the last phase of the talk here, and I hope that I'm still uh, a reasonable amount of time. Um, but uh, um, I was asked to sort of uh, talk about resources to acquire and apply knowledge of bio biological weed control for IPM for invasive weeds. And I'll talk about some resources available um, from the California Invasive Plant Council, including this best management practices for non-chemical weed control. This is a uh, book. Uh, you can get it, a PDF copy at using the link there. Um, it covers not just biocontrol, but a lot of different uh, other forms of control, you know, tarping and uh, burning and uh, grubbing and uh, manual removal and different different uh, tools for uh, for physical removal, cultural control. And then it has um, a section on biocontrol. There's also a what's called a weed cut online decision support tool that's been published by the um, University of California um, extension. And uh, it actually doesn't incorporate biocontrol, but essentially what it's designed to do is you enter your weed and your habitat, and then it sort of tells you which control approaches are outside of herbicides, which control approaches are most likely to uh, be successful. Um, so in terms of the, the best management practices, this was a collaboration uh, between Lincoln Smith and myself and also Michael Pitkern from the CDFA who retired recently. But we, um, Essentially, we're asked to review different biocontrol systems for California and, and the potential use um, and how they could be used by uh, control practitioners, natural resource managers. So we had a total of 18 weed targets uh, that were uh, 18 chapters and 24 weed species. And I won't go through all of these here, but these are all the weeds that were covered, both older and newer biocontrol systems. And it turns out um, there's not in, there's not in some cases there's not a biocontrol agent that's re readily available for redistribution. Um, there's a few cases where there's a biocontrol agent that um, you might be able to obtain pretty easily. There's other cases where it's more up to you as the pr practitioner to go sort of see if the agent is already present at your site, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, so there are potential you know opportunities to leverage biocontrol um, even even if the agent is not widely available for distribution. Topics covered in the best management practices, sort of an overview, biocontrol agents, which ones are available, which ones are permitted, um, how to release the agent, um, uh, if it's available, where, you, where could you get them. Of course, photographs are very important to identify the biocontrol agents. And uh, the important to distinguish release versus adventive biocontrol agents. Uh, so intentionally released agents are um, uh, permitted by the USDA APHIS and um, also permitted by CDFA for release in California. And of course, they've been tested for safety prior to release, and they may be available for redistribution. The adventive agents that we've talked about do not have uh, release permits. Um, they've arrived accidentally from others. They were either introduced accidentally within California or they distributed themselves into, Cal into California from other states. They may actually have impact on the weed as I demonstrated, for example, for the Scotch broom mite. Um, you can't redistrib redistribute, redistribute them without permission from the CDFA. Um, in some cases, CDFA may actually grant permission to do that, but uh, it takes the kind of research that I mentioned on Scotch broom, where we're, we're evaluating whether the, the mite is safe. That what? Excuse me, no, I just wanted to. Um, so talk about sort of the last stage here. Um, if you're working out at your site and you're um, considering control techniques, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a worthwhile to evaluate uh, whether biocontrol agents are present. Um, they may or they may or not be impactful, but it's worthwhile to evaluate evaluate where they're uh, they're present or not. So you can survey for external damage. Um, you can use the Cal Ipsy uh, best management practices to sort of uh, determine which agents are present, sort of what the damage looks like. Um, and uh, for example, external feeders make scars on the the leaf tissue. 
They, um, if you have internal feeders, they might uh, make holes in the stem. For example, this this picture here shows the arundel, the holes made by the arundel wasp as they emerge from galls. So that's an easy way to, to diagnose the presence of the arundel wasp. Uh, if you have time, you can also collect stems and fruits or seed heads and dissect them in the field or um, at your office or lab if you have a lab. You can uh, look for the internal feeders. Uh, in many cases, what you'll see are immatures. You'll see larvae and pupae. Um, and uh, it's important, whether it's you're looking for external or internal damage, to uh, sample systematically, not just one random place, but may maybe you know every 10 paces, maybe do, you know, just, um, go through your site and sample several different places. Biocontrol agents can be patchy in their distribution, so it's important to sort of um, get, a, get a complete picture of what's going on. And in some cases, scientists can help you with that. Um, we sometimes go out and do that kind of work. Uh, you can get, uh, sometimes there are a few university scientists in California who, who do this kind of work, so. You can also examine uh, for the ex presence of the insects themselves as opposed to their damage. Uh, you can, uh, if you know what the insects look like, you can survey, um, you can do sweep netting. We do this a lot for yellow star thistle, for example, to look for the seed head feeders. Or you can also use sticky traps. Um, of course, where that's a lethal technique. Whatever gets trapped on the on the sticky trap will not survive. But um, you could sort of uh, put out sticky traps. We did this for the Arundel wasp, for example, this past summer, and we it was a very useful way to detect low populations of the wasp that we might not have detected otherwise in certain areas. And um, so that's different ways to look look at the presence of the uh, the insect. So the question is, if you uh, are the agents present or not, and so if, if you don't find any weed biocontrol agents for your target weed, um, consider obtaining some, and that, and that may not be that uh, may not be possible in many cases, but um, there are a few cases, as mentioned in the best management practices, where biocontrol agents may potentially uh, be available for redistribution. You can work with your county ag commissioner, uh, the UC um, extension, or contact CDFA more information, or you can contact me um, for more information on what biocontrol agents might be available. If they're already present, it's probably not necessarily worthwhile to release more if it's already there. But the idea is that if it's present but kind of sparse or in low density, uh, consider leaving a plot untreated. If you're going to be applying herbicide or doing some mowing or uh, rubbing, consider leaving a, a plot untreated to allow population buildup. And then if the agent is present, if one or more agents are present and abundant, uh, you could consider not treating using those other methods that you are planning to use if it's consistent with the management goals and the stakeholder customer customer needs. I know that's very important um, that the, uh, the uh, needs of the stakeholder are, are important uh, in terms of how fast they want the weed to be uh, to be removed. And uh, the biocontrol agents uh, technique is, is a slower technique, so there, it may be necessary to spray or, or chop or whatever, even if the biocontrol agent is present. But that's all I have. Um, thank you again for your work to uh, control invasive weeds and other invasive species. Um, you're definitely uh, helping to protect soil and water resources and natural habitats including some of those urban habitats in San Francisco, I know, but are still important for uh, the quality of life in those uh, places like the Golden Gate Park and other areas. So uh, thank you for that work and um, can talk about, you know, take some questions or talk about uh, other stuff as needed. So thank you.